and uh, smart and nanopore are long range sequences uh, illumina and your uh, ion torrent are short range sequences now we come to ngs applications now why ngs has become so important in biotechnology is because there is nothing that is untouched by next generation sequencing technologies for example you can have a dna sequence so you can use it for variant calling snp calling or structural variations so this is called dna sec then you can use it for studying the epigenome or the methylation status of the genome this is called bs sec or bisulfite sec then of course you can do transcriptome analysis where you are typically studying the entire mrna of a there's called rna sec and then you could study dna protein interactions which is called chip sec and uh, again this is where in case you have proteins that bind to a C in a sequence specific pattern uh, manner then you can use this technology very clearly to understand what is at what time and what is the impact of the dna protein binding on the expression levels of the genes and so on and so forth so your analysis can be depending on what is your experiment so the key features of ngs scalability as i told you it is massively parallel sequencing high throughput parallel processing of thousands of samples speed it is much quicker than sanger sequencing you can do a whole genome in 2 to 3 days or maybe 20 20 minutes to 30 minutes then you can do an entire exome in a day i'll come to what is an exome it is high resolution it is deep you have a lot of depth in sequencing so you are very sure when you say that there is a polymorphism here you are sure of what is the extent of polymorphism and you are sure that you are not going wrong here uh, i told you it is high coverage single base pair resolution and then the assembly that you do most commonly here is reference based assembly you already have a sequence you know you just line your reads up there and get your sequence as of now with long read sequences you can also do a de novo assembly people have attempted de novo assembly with uh, small read sequences as well but then that is not as successful so exome sequencing so as i said while the cost of genome sequencing has come to around $1000 somewhere around $1000 not exactly $1000 it is still prohibitive $1000 today would mean around uh, how much 70000 rupees or something and you we know that most of the uh, disease causing mutations are within the protein coding genes which are only 1.5% of the entire genome so if 85% of the mutation that cause disease are within the protein coding genes i can do only the sequencing of the protein coding genes and leave aside the rest of the genomic material and that would bring down the cost of sequencing very heavily and i still not compromise too much with the information because you still get 85% information of your disease susceptibility so that is what is exome sequencing uh, you can uh, basically fish out the regions that code for genes using uh, probes and then directly do the sequencing of exactly only those regions instead of sequencing the entire genome this brings down the cost and it is extremely useful in whole genome analysis of uh, biomedical conditions right? some of the mendelian diseases that did via next generation sequencing you have a list of them i'm not going to the details so this is providing an improved clinical diagnosis more accurate genotype phenotype correlations and new insights into the role of rare genomic variations in disease you can do targeted panels suppose you know that these mutations are these positions in the human genome are important for a certain type of disease let's say cancer so you can only sequence these regions instead of sequencing the entire genome so you can select a set of genes or a set of positions that you want to sequence multiple genes can be assessed across many samples in parallel saving time and reducing cut reducing costs associated with running multiple separate assays and this is basically also important because it produces a, a smaller more manageable and more significant data as compared to a whole lot of background that you may get when you do a whole genome sequencing now one of the important uh, things that has been facilitated by next generation sequencing is metagenomics metagenomics is also known as community genomics where you can study the entire uh, or environmental genomics where you can study the entire uh, content of microbes in a given uh, in a given sample uh, without any loss of biodiversity normally what we did before the ngs uh, came into the picture was first you 
let's say you have to you have to identify the biodiversity in the soil around hindu college so you would get the soil sample you would then do a culture grow the bacteria and then whatever bacteria you recover you will isolate the dna and then sequence now the problem with that is that when you grow the culture and in, uh, in lab conditions a lot of biodiversity is lost and it is never recovered in your final set of uh, you know, set of uh, population that to retrieve after culturing so with ngs what you can do is directly get the environmental sample extract genomic dna directly do a pcr of the hypervariable region sequence and then do a bioinformatic analysis or you can do a whole genome metagenome sequencing you can directly sequence the entire genome and then look for what it matches to in the databases right so uh, it is basically genomics on a huge scale it enables to survey different microorganisms present in a specific environment such as water soil etc to be carried out also you can identify community relationships suppose a type of bacteria is present in a very high proportion let's say a 90% as compared to a b type of bacteria so you know what is the dominant population in your community versus the other population in the community and that can also allow you to identify the functional relationship between communities in a given ecosystem right and uh, why do we want to identify new microorganisms or characterize new microorganisms than what we already know so as you know uh, we want new molecules for therapeutic intervention because for most of the existing drugs the pathogens have now uh, developed antimicrobial resistance so amr so basically for any drug that you give now the pathogen is also resistant already resistant to the drug and it is now a big problem so we now need new set of uh, molecules that can provide us new uh, interventions and for that you first need to identify the uncultured micro diverse microbial diversity that exists today so metagenomics uh, 16s rna typing so 16s rna region is characteristic for each species you can do your 16s rna uh, targeted sequencing of 16s rna genes in the population that you have and then identify the species the, the number of species that are present in your sample and also their community relations based on uh, the abundance of a particular type of 16s rna signature right so there are some microbiome projects that are very much uh, running as of now so you have the human microbiome project you would have heard the gut microbiome project there we are trying to now identify the total diversity that exists in the gut of human beings and the idea is that it is a, uh, it has been postulated that healthy human beings will have a different uh, set of uh, uh, organisms in their gut microflora as compared to a uh, unhealthy human being so a lot of disease that you now see are being associated with the gut uh, the the composition of your gut flora and fauna and therefore now we are trying to uh, understand the gut microbiome in a lot more details you have earth microbiome project we are trying to systematically and catalog the entire micro micro population that exists on earth and then also in the environmental para space uh, to so as to define the protein universe and the community structure that exists we are also into pharmacogenomics uh, so pharmacogenomics is the study of the genomic influence on drug response often using high throughput data so high throughput data means ngs or next generation sequencing i'll give an example of how this is done for example there is a purine analog that is used in cancer studies so this is called 6 mercaptopurin it is cytotoxic an immunosuppressive drug six mercaptopurin is given as azathioprine azathioprine it is metabolized to six mercaptopurin in the body six mercaptopurin is further metabolized in the body to finally give the functional product this is six thioguanin nucleotides six thioguanin nucleotides uh, when incorporated during dna replication actually kill the cells however the six mercaptopurin that are administering administering can also be metabolized by another enzyme in the in the body that is known as tpmt or thiopurin methyltransferase which adds a methyl group to mercaptopurin and now this molecule 6 methyl mercaptopurin is dysfunctional which means it will not have the lethality that we want here so this is our functional molecule this is our side molecule which gets converted via tpmt right 
So six mercaptopurine is a cytotoxic immunosuppressive drug. This is the structural formula for that. It is used to treat lymphoblastic leukemia, autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel disease, post solid transplant. The cytotoxic end product of six mercaptopurine is six thiogonin neglotide, which interferes with DNA replication, leading to cell death. However, as I told you, 6 mercaptopurine can be converted to 6 methyl mercaptopurine. Now, this molecule is useless for us. So, what we want is that most of our medicine should grow, should go this way and not this way. Right? Now, if you see the TPMT, uh, the TPMT is polymorphic, and there are very each individual can have variations in the DNA that allow for a slightly lower efficient TPMT molecule to be present. For example, here you have this variant here where you have uh, guanine replaced by cytosine at 238 position, resulting in the replacement of palladin by, by a proline. And this molecule is less effective as compared to the wild type molecule. Likewise, you have other variations. So basically, TPMT is polymorphic in the human population. And therefore, depending on whether the individual is is a wild type or variant for TPMT, the dose may be toxic or less toxic. So the TPMT activity for variants, which is homolog a homozygous variant, is very low. It is slightly higher in heterozygous individuals and it is very high in wild type. Right? Now why this is important is because when you give the dosage, normally what happens is when you go to a doctor, the doctor says, okay, uh, take these medicines, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. But then this is not customized medicine. This is basically a blind thing that you are giving the same dosage to every individual irrespective of what variations is carrying. Now in case of TPMTC, if what happens is, if this is your regular uh, uh, dosage for both variant heterozygous and wild type, homozygous variant, heterozygous and wild type, you will have a lot of toxicity in the variant because all of it is available for cytotoxicity. It will be slightly less in case of heterozygous variants where the violated it will still be toxic, but it will be less toxic, least toxic in a homozygous wild type here, right? So what basically this indicates is when you go to a doctor for a medicine, you have to know what polymorphisms you carry. Based on that, the doctor can suggest you uh, the dosage that will be optimum for you without reducing excessive toxicity. For example, here for an individual who is a variant homozygous where there is no TPMT activity, which means all the other thioprin that is given directly goes into 6 thiogonin. These can be administered a very lower dose, low dose to be as effective as somebody who is wild type where most of it is going here and therefore a higher dosage has to be given for the same effectivity, right? So basically, uh, so this example very clearly indicates that based on individual variations, the dosage variation of the medicine is important, which we have not been doing until now. And therefore you hear people, some say that uh, the medicine was very effective for me. Others say it was absolutely to say it, it actually caused a reaction to me. So that is basically because we are all different and because we are all different, the medicine interacts with the genome differently depending on what variations you're carrying. So this is one very good example of that. Now coming to genome sequencing milestones, uh, the first sequence was sequenced way back in 1977, bacteriophage by X74, then of course Haemophilus influenzae and since then there have been continuous uh, uh, achievements. And of course, the crown and glory was human genome sequence uh, in 2001. And now we can also sequence uh, DNA from uh, pre existing animals uh, or mammals. For example, Neanderthal, which is our closest human relative, a part of this, its DNA was resynthesized from the fossils uh, that, were, uh, that were isolated uh, from Heidelberg, I think. Then uh, this is a good review that you can see for applications of DNA sequencing at 40, past, present, and future. Uh, I'll also give you a DOI in some of the slides that is there. Then, uh, recently we have also sequenced the axolotl genome. This is the largest genome to be sequenced till date. It is 10 times as large as the human genome. So this is 
the larger genome ever sequence, scientists have decoded the genome sequence of axolotl, the Mexican amphibian. Uh, the human genome size is 3.2 billion base pairs, which is approximately 32 billion base pairs, which makes it 10 times the size of the human genome. And we are interested in seeing uh, why there is so much of uh, uh, excessive genome size in these individuals. And if you know, there is something called C-value paradox, which states that the genome size has no direct correlation with the complexity of the organism. So there's one such example of that. Then uh, all uh, next generation sequencing file formats are standard. So you'll have four lines in the sequence. The first line would be your basically uh, read ID. Then you have the sequence. You have a repeat of read ID. This is optional. And then you have a quality score or the quality call for each of the nucleotide here in the sequence. So this four, uh, four line uh, format is standard for all NGS data. Then of course, because you get reads that have to be aligned for a, to a different genome for assembly, depending on which platform you're using, you have platform specific aligners, and then you have, for example, solid, you have very specific platforms. 454 platforms, then you have some platforms that can be that can take reads from any of the sequencing platforms. For example, uh, you can have solid, you can have uh, borough wheelers algorithm, you can both solid and 454 and Illumina data can be used here. So some algorithms are specific to a sequencing platform, some algorithms are generic and can take reads from any platform and align it to your reference genome. I've already given you this reference. Uh, DNA sequencing at 40, past, present, future. It is a very nice read, and uh, the first uh, few lines are very interesting. There they say that to sequence initially, it took three months for one very small stretch of DNA. And now we're sequencing the entire human genome in a matter of uh, less than half a day. Right. Now, uh, from your point of view, sequencing mostly is done by companies, so uh, labs may also do it, but mostly now it is uh, also because it is a very standard uh, practice so it is mostly outsourced to companies or uh, CSOs. Now uh, the part where the student role comes in is in the NGS data analysis. Now NGS data is typically big data characterized by velocity, veracity and variety and you need to have certain data on uh, uh, data analytics and computational skills to be able to analyze this data. Uh, more very importantly you must know one programming language Python is the most preferred as of today because most of the algorithms that are being used now are written in Python. Then R is equally important. R is open source. Therefore, you don't have to pay anything for this. So this is very important. It is a statistical language and it comes in very handy when you're analyzing, analyzing your data. You have to be good at biostatistics because we are dealing with high throughput data, which means there is a lot of data. And from this lot of data, you have to pull out significant data that every step there is a statistical test that has to be put in. And therefore, you must know a bit of bioinformatics so as to be able to, uh, so as to be able to analyze the data. Awk is a very handy uh, language or uh, that can be used for analyzing data provided it is in columns and rows. And uh, all these are not very difficult. Uh, slight, uh, actually, it basically is on interest. Then there are some very fixed tools that are used for uh, uh, data analysis, uh, NGS data analysis, for example, PICCART, SAM tools, BET tools, BESMARC. BESMARC is specifically for bisulfide seg data, which I've used during my postdoc. And then, of course, you need familiarity with the Linux environment so as to ensure that you can work comfortably and quickly and uh, manage this size of data in the stipulated time that is given to you. Then uh, if you want to learn R interactively, you can go to my site here. This is called Weapon C Classroom. If you Google Weapons Classroom, it will take you directly to my page. And uh, you can go to Weapons Crackets. And here I have given some instructions how to learn R interactively and how to download and install R. Uh, this will give you the basic introduction to uh, R. And then you can move on and do as, as per your interest. Uh, programming is uh, basically intoxicating if one gets into it. Some people may like wine, some people may, lock, may not like wine, so it is up to your taste. But uh, if you get into it, this is the best uh, area to be in if you want to be 
recruited with good companies. It gives you a lot of IT skills and everything. So you have, you can go into IT as well as into bioinformatics. And I would suggest that every student should know some basic programming now because now the data is not uh, one gene or two gene or three gene or one protein or two protein. It is the entire proteome, the entire genome, the entire transcriptome. And unless you know a bit of programming, it will be difficult to analyze the data. So you can have a good start here. You can start with R and programming is easy. If I can learn it, then you can definitely learn it, right? All right, so we started with Sanger sequencer here. This is the ABI present sequencer. Then we went to Illumina, we went to Ion Torrent. Then we went to a smart or single molecule real-time sequencing. Then we went to Nanopore and then we went to Promethan, which is Nanopore multiplexed. Right, so I'll stop here and uh, I hope I have been able to do justice to the topic that was given to me and uh, I am open to questions if anybody is interested in asking. These were some of the early birds who came uh, very early in the talk. Right? So I took some screen grabs. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Vipin, for providing yeah. such exhaustive information about next generation.